now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. It's 7.05. Thanks for tuning in here on O'Connor and Company this Monday morning in your nation's capital. Coming up in 30 minutes, Laura Morgan with Do No Harm. She's a 40-year nurse veteran, and now in Virginia, she's going to be forced with other nurses to take bias training because Democrats. And one Republican, we'll name names coming up in a bit, at 805 Maggie Cleary. She's the deputy commonwealth attorney in Culpeper County. Talk about a new plan for Democrats in Virginia to cap criminal sentences because we've been too tough on the people breaking our laws in the state. And then at 835, as we've just been discussing, Billboard Chris, Chris Elston, gives us the latest on the uh, transitioning craze. It's Larry O'Connor alongside Julie Gunlock. Good morning. Julie, good morning to you and a happy <laughs> Munye to you, by the way. It's just In the Monday, last Larry. hour, I was just, a little... It's just I, Monday. It's I was Monday. somewhat discourteous. I feel like I was pitting you against Patrice as she has such what? a joyful, sunny disposition on Fridays, <laughs> and she launches us into the weekend, and then every Monday, you bring us back to reality. I see you're not really sorry. Not really. <laughs> I also I think it's a misnomer that Monday is a problem day, because every Monday at this time, we have Joe DeGeneva, that's and right. that's... The best. Good morning, Joe. Good to talk with you. Good morning. Good morning. So the Supreme Court is set to hear the arguments with regard to Donald Trump's uh, eligibility to be on the Colorado ballot. How do you think these discussions will go? Just remind everybody, the Secretary of State, or excuse me, the state Supreme Court in Colorado determined uh, through a petition from the Democrats in that state, that because of January 6th, uh, as it relates to the 14th Amendment, language that was crafted coming out of the Civil War, that Donald Trump waged an insurrection against the United States of America and therefore is ineligible to run for federal office. How do you expect the conversation to go, Joe? Well, the court has extended uh, argument to allow uh, a couple more people to be heard including the Secretary of State of Colorado. Um, I don't think the court is going to reach the question of whether Donald Trump is an insurrectionist or whether or not an insurrection occurred on January 6th, which it clearly did not. The court is going to probably take the easy way out and say that under the 14th Amendment, Section 3, Donald Trump was not an officer of the United States, and therefore the clause does not apply to him. He is the president of the United States, not an officer of the United States. He is Article 2, the executive branch, as we all know from our study of the Constitution, appears in Article 2 of the Constitution, and they say the president is the executive branch. He's not an officer of the executive branch. He is the executive branch. I think that's what the court is going to do. They're going to avoid the issue completely and say, you got the wrong guy. So the way you put it, it makes it sound as though they're, you said, the easy way out or avoiding the issue. But, but what you just articulated would actually be pretty sweeping with regard to what's being attempted in other states, whether it's Maine or sure. Michigan or what. I mean, it's just sure. a, a, enough. You get elected to be president. This doesn't apply to you. Yeah. And let's also remember that Trump was acquitted in the Senate on uh, a lot of this nonsense involving January 6th. So they, they don't even I mean, that's that issue sits there resolved by the political branches okay. of our government. If, and so if, I, if I'm the Supreme Court, I'm, if I'm the Supreme Court, I'm not looking for a fight. Believe me, right. John Roberts is risk averse. And so I think they'll take the easy way out and say he's not an officer of the United States. Quick follow-up on that, though, Joe. Um, we saw, mysteriously, Jack Smith's prosecution of Donald Trump, not on insurrection <laughs> charges, but other charges related to January 6th, mysteriously disappear from the docket. We were supposed to start our trial in March, and now it's not on the schedule. What do you make of that? Well, I think Judge Chuck Chutkin figured out she better stop fooling around with Jack Smith before she gets herself in a lot of trouble. She doesn't know what's coming down the pike in the next election uh, whether or not the Senate is going to be Republican or Democrat, whether or not the House is going to be in an impeachment mode. I think Judge Chutkin figured out that the appeal is still sitting up in the D.C. Circuit about whether or not Donald Trump is immune from prosecution under that case. 
And it's everyone thought the D.C. Circuit was going to rule almost immediately that they had been quietly writing their opinions, waiting for the appeal to come out. But we have no opinion as of Friday. And that's got people worried. And Judge Cheskin said it looks like this thing is going to take a little more time and that it's going to go to the Supreme Court anyway. That's going to take a lot of time because the court is going to listen to this case and they are going to take it, the Supreme Court, and they're going to write on it. They're not going to just issue an order. So I think she figured she better get out of Dodge and uh, just take this off her calendar, which is what she did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Joe, I want to pivot over to um, Alvin Bragg um, responding. (laughs) We we have a we have a a cut here, cut 10 of him responding to criticism of illegals. I I want to play that and, and get your reaction. Bragg implied he did not request bail because he's being cautious to make sure his office charged the right suspects. That is what's required to secure a conviction and get accountability and send the right people to jail. And that's what we've been working on all week. Hmm. (laughs) So, uh, Joe, what do you make of this? Well, Alvin Bragg is a very bad prosecutor. He is an anti-cop prosecutor. He is a pro-criminal prosecutor. He is one terrible DA that the people of New York City, Manhattan, and the appropriate boroughs elected. He is their choice. So New York City did it to itself. Uh, The cops didn't do this to themselves, but he did. I think his explanation is ludicrous. These people all should have been held without bail, and now they're never going to get them back. These folks will be headed to California, where they're Mm -hmm. getting Gavin Newsom's $1,000 credit card, back to Mexico. Yeah. Maybe they'll come across the border again. They're never going to see these defendants. And Alvin Bragg and the judge in the case who let them out without them. You know what you do if you're a judge in a case like this? You slap a big number on them. You say that they're going to flee. Obviously, you can... You can easily say that they are a likely flight risk uh, because of who they are and how they got to the United States. They're all illegal aliens who crossed the border illegally. Uh, So a a pox on the judicial house in New York and Alvin Bragg, who is nothing more than a legal thug. This is what I wanted to ask you. It's how does a judge determine they're not a likely flight risk when their one claim to fame to get into this country is literally fleeing their own nation without documentation? And and you get to get on a plane to Los Angeles by showing your arrest warrant. Yeah, that's your ID. (laughs) That's your ID. I mean, usually that kind of thing is only reserved for Hunter Biden, Joe. But that usually keeps you off a plane. Yes, Joe, this can you stick around? I wanted to ask you, there there seems to be a question here, as we now see the details of the Senate so-called border security bill, which literally spends more <laughs> money on Ukraine than on our border. <laughs> but I, I do love it when you start laughing like that. But there's some question about whether Joe Biden needs a new law to enforce mm. existing law. I, I, I feel like I already know the answer, but could you give us your legal analysis on that in just a moment? Oh, I'd be delighted. WMAL, making sense of the markets, because generational wealth doesn't build itself. Download the WMAL app to stream us for free. I want to prove here that you uh, you don't even need to be a great legal mind and a former U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, as Joe DeGeneva is, to figure this out. Uh, here's, here's the second greatest legal mind of our time, second only to uh, Joe DeGeneva. He's Bill Maher. But even, but even Bill Maher could figure this one out over the weekend on his show. Part two of the acting yeah. is Joe, is, is Joe okay. Biden saying, you know what, if you just give me a new law, a new law, why doesn't the president can fix this? He already has the existing law. And border patrol this, this is also right silly. to your face. I need a piece of yeah. paper from Congress to deal with the border. No, you already have that. That's right. That's right. That's right. And, and a smattering of applause, a real life smattering there from his audience. But, Joe, that, that is the case. You saw Biden saying, I've done everything I can on my control. We need, and, and you've got these senators who are saying, that's right, we need to pass this law. Do, they, do we even need a new law? No, 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 no new law is necessary. All of the executive power exists under Article 2 and under existing immigration law for the president to seal the border. President Biden does not want to seal the border. Remember? On the day after inauguration, 
He signed almost 62 executive orders, included among them were a group which completely opened the border purposely. It is the official policy of the Biden administration. He ran on this. He said it in appearances while he was a candidate that he wanted an open border with Mexico. Yep. He got it. He established it. It is his baby. And when I hear James Lankford talk about this bill, I feel like I'm watching a z- and listening to his zombie-like incantations. It's like something out of the Night of the Living Dead. He is so strange. He, he looks like a zombie. He sounds like a zombie. He, he, I, I, I'm, I'm just absolute. The Democrats brazenly put out this nonsense that there's a need for this bill. This is our biggest chance ever to get immigration reform. What a bunch of crap. The Republicans in the Senate who caved to this are morons. They're yeah. idiots. They don't deserve to be in the Senate. What they wanted, what they want to be able to say, oh, we, we got a comprehensive solution. Guess what? You give him a new bill, he's going to ignore it. Biden will never ex- even recognize that this bill passed. He That's will right. find ways to right. ignore it. Right. He will never do with it. These people like Langford and all these other moron Republicans are idiots. Thank you. I mean, if, if he's not following our current law, what makes you think that your brand new law is going to be followed? Number one. Number two, it doesn't even have to pass, Julie, because now this is all they needed to do was create this document. Well, and, the, and, yeah. and and Biden can run and say, well, we tried, but you got to give me more Republicans. And, and they've acknowledged the fact they they've essentially s- said, well, there's a problem and we need to fix it for him. There's never mm. been a problem. Right. He right, can he can until, close the border. Yeah. It, Biden it, created the problem yep. purposely so he but can l- fix l- it. Yep. Let me let me let me get um, I don't want to say conspiratorial, let Go me, ahead. L- but let me but let me think two steps ahead. Th- there are people in this town, in this government, as we've seen on both sides of the aisle who who are proactively in favor of keeping this border open and proactively in favor for various reasons of having this flow of millions of people coming into this country. Is this bill, (coughs) should it, God forbid, ever be passed, would this actually, in a way, this ties the hands of the next guy? This actually, if I'm reading it right, it actually puts more controls over what the next president can do in terms of declaring a border emergency and shutting down the border. Absolutely. You're giving all sorts of power to the Democratic Party, which cares about one thing. The Democrats care about having more voters and more people coming into this country illegally. They want to be able to convert those people into voters, either because they want them to vote in local elections as illegals, like they're allowed or thought to be allowed to do in New York, although a court struck that down. This is a plan that the Democrats have. There's nothing accidental about this. When when Biden opened the border on Inauguration Day, he did so with a plan. This is this is all purposeful. And anybody who thinks by passing, first of all, passing a law is not going to change what Biden's doing. He will find a reason not to do it. He'll yeah. figure out another way to get them into the country. Uh, he will figure out a way to completely destroy the notion of parole or amnesty or whatever it is. But this is a joke. And the Republicans who cooperated on this in the Senate are fools. They're stupid they're idiots. They don't deserve to be in the Republican Party. It's just nauseating to watch these idiots. I really, Langford, I've spent time with the guy in small group meetings, and he has a strange zealotry about him. He's a kind of a religious guy. He's very, very into religion. And I think there's part of him that thinks this is Christian forgiveness, mm-hmm. that we got to do this. we got to help these people. It's, it's part of that, you know, liberation theology that the Catholic Church was involved in in Central America. Langford's all liberation theology dressed up in different garb. Interesting. You know, I was going to make a crack about, you know, well, he's a redhead. What do you expect? And then I realized, well, your beautiful wife is a ginger (laughs) as well. So I don't want to I don't want to go there. (laughs) Uh, Believe me. Langford's a redhead, but he's the he's the he's he's got his brain. He's not a Victoria Townsend kind of redhead. Look at Joe DiGenova, you know. Little Italian kid from the wrong side of the tracks grows up to be the U.S. attorney and marries a gorgeous redhead. What a life you've got, Joe. That's right. And, and, and if we only had a U.S. attorney in D.C., we wouldn't have any crime. 
Oh, gosh, I, we didn't even get to all of that with the, the, the great proclamation that you can't arrest and convict your way out of that. That feels like a month ago. It was just five days ago here. That, we was, might have our, to... that was our District, District of Columbia Attorney General, another yes. moron. We might have to add a second day for Joe during this election year. We'll, we'll, we'll take it under consideration. Joe, thanks for joining us, man. Peace in our time, hopefully. It is 723. <laughs> Now on 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. It's a great Monday morning here in the nation's capital. Thanks for tuning in to O'Connor and Company as we're we're waking up the whole country here on America's favorite morning show. Coming up at 805 Maggie Cleary will join us, Deputy Commonwealth Attorney in Culpeper County, about a brand new bill Democrats passed down in Richmond that will cap the criminal sentences for felons, violent felons, indeed. And then at 835, Chris Elston, Billboard Chris, will join us. I'm Larry O'Connor alongside Julie Gunlock. Good morning. Good morning, Julie, and good morning to Laura Morgan. She is the chief of staff of Do No Harm which, of course, you know is part of the uh, Hippocratic Oath, right? That's what doctors and medical professionals are, at the very least, supposed to do. No harm. She is a 40-year nurse veteran, and she joins us now about a bill making its way through Richmond. Thanks for joining us, ma'am. Thank you, Larry and Julie, and good morning to you. So th- there's a lot to unpack here. I want to start first with what the details of SB 35 are. And then it, it was proposed by Democrats, but sadly there's a uh, there's a Republican supporting it. I want to get to that in a minute. But the on the face of it, this proposes mandatory implicit bias training for nurses. And when I look at implicit implicit bias training, and I've tried to unpack this and see lots of examples of it, it's basically usually vast majority of times set up in such a way where the curriculum forces the individual taking that training to admit their built-in biases, to to admit, basically, you're not going to get your license renewed if you're a nurse right now in Virginia unless you do some sort of, you know, uh, uh, sit in front of a tribunal and say, yes, yes, I'm racist, I'm racist. Is that, I mean, I'm, I know I'm painting with broad strokes, but that's what these usually end up being. That really is what it boils down to. And the bill's language does include both, the boards of nursing and medicine. So this bill will affect all 320 medical and nursing practitioners in the state of Virginia. Wow. And, um, and, and, and right now, if a private corporation that's hiring these nurses or doctors, if they want to go through some sort of DEI training or whatever, there's nothing stopping them. But this would mandate it, that you cannot practice medicine in Virginia unless you first admit you're a racist. That is correct. Uh, The bill proposes that without the implicit bias training, that licenses will not be able to be renewed. And this is a little surprising in a time when we've heard much news about the lack of nurses and physicians available to take care of patients already. And we've heard from nurses and physicians in other states that already mandate this. And some of them are actually leaving the profession over it because yeah. they don't want to 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 um, agree with those uh, principles. Right. Laura, isn't, isn't this also already sort of a part of your training? Aren't you taught as a nurse or anyone in the medical field that you are to treat people equally, that you're supposed to give equal care, that, um, you know, you're not supposed to consider things like, race or sex or any of the like you're just supposed to give good care so i find this so insulting uh again because it assumes you all are you know there's bad people in this industry but again i just i if you could sort of shed light on the fact that this is already part of your training to 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 give people good care no matter who they are julie it always has been from day one. And the word you used, insulting, is the one that other practitioners use when they contact us about what can I do about this training. And indeed, physicians and nurses are taught from day one that you treat all your patients equally. But unfortunately, concepts like implicit bias go along with other concepts such as health equity, which doesn't have anything to do with equality. You know, I think also people are afraid that these sort of concepts introduce ideas like, you know, let's sort people into different groups. You are an oppressor. You are oppressed. You have benefit because of the 
color of your skin or because of what sex you are, don't you feel like some of these trainings almost introduce these concepts that before people weren't really thinking about? 100%. And, you know, by the time medical students get to med school, they've already had years of indoctrination of this because it goes all the way through the undergraduate system of higher education. And, you know, it's surprising that Republicans in Virginia would vote for such a thing when yeah. Republicans in other states are vo voting to move away from it. Yeah, that brings us to Senator Chris Head. Don't know the man. He's down in uh, the Roanoke area, but apparently he has crossed lines in the Senate and he has supported this as well. What What is he thinking? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, it's really disappointing that this happens because the the concepts of implicit bias are really in direct opposition to what equality means um, to to go along with the thing in which we need to bring about some sort of utopian state of health equity, which is not yeah. Yeah. achievable, is very surprising. This is Senate Bill 35, and Republican Chris Head has actually co-sponsored it. He's the only Republican who's spoken on it. And, and this is at a time, by the way, when DEI, this whole diversity, equity, inclusion, which is basically sort of manifest in this bill, it's uh, finally being scrutinized and being removed either from college campuses. We saw it play out in Harvard earlier this year. Uh, corporations are defunding their DEI programs right now. It, he's going in the wrong direction. Uh, there's no way Governor Yunkin would sign this, even if it makes it up to his desk, would he? Well, I, I hope not, because there's been you know some some mention of limiting government interference in our daily lives. <laughs> yeah. And Senate Bill 35 actually requires monitoring of the training that the that physicians and nurses taking when they're traditionally self-reporting that. But yeah. now there will be mandatory re monitoring of that. It, it's outrageous. Senator Head, we'd love to talk to Senator Head and find out exactly what he's thinking here. He's buying into a myth. It's a racist myth, by the way. Yes. That's the that's the ironic thing. When you sign on to these things, you're siding with the racists, the people who only see life through the eyes of race. Uh, Laura Morgan, do no harm. Thank you for looking out for the medical caregivers in Virginia, and hopefully we'll kill this thing in its tracks. We appreciate it and would love your listeners to go to do no harm medicine dot org and see the work we're doing. Thank you, ma'am. Well, this it kind of sucker punched me, if I can use that pun here, uh, when we learned that Carl Weathers passed away without any. I mean, uh, uh, he, Carl Weathers has had a bit of a career resurgence here. He, of course, burst onto the Hollywood scene as Apollo Creed in the Rocky films. And he I mean. Obviously, his character was supposed to be like a bigger version, if that's possible, of Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. uh, he was amazing. It was a great character written by his friend Sylvester Stallone. He portrayed Apollo Creed and sort of captured the zeitgeist of that whole era, the late 70s and through the 80s and all of those Rocky movies. And then, you know, he's in a weird way, Carl Weathers or sort of, you know, he started doing things that were a parody of his, himself, you know, in some of the acting choices. But then suddenly he's had this resurgence. He was in The Mandalorian. Um, that he's, Creed series, which is related Creed to Rocky, series. I think. Yeah. yeah. And he'd been, and, and I just saw him, he's doing a ad campaign with uh, Rob Gronkowski for FanDuel, where Gronk has to kick a a field goal at halftime, remember, and people bet on whether he'll make it or miss it. They started this last year, and he missed it. So this year, he's like in retraining to do the field goal, and they brought in They're Carl Weathers it. as the oh. guy trained, just like in Rocky <laughs> Three, when Carl Weathers, you yes. know, trained Rocky to fight Clubber Lang. I, I, I'm sorry, do I watch too many Rocky no, movies? No, no, no. But you mentioned that that training where you know I I must have watched that training sort of clip. Yeah, uh, where Rocky is on the beach. Right. And he can't he can't beat Carl Weathers. But then at the end of his training, he beats him. And then they're right. jumping in the ocean. I must have watched that 50 times yeah, this weekend, amazing. that clip. Uh, that sprint. So, yeah. it's, it's so sad, you know, he, he, when these sort of icons of certainly our young sort of teen years and younger I'll years, are, you know, die. It's, it's, and it's there was no build up to it. It's, it's right. not like, you know, he announced he had cancer. Right, he had this right. disease. Your head is just right. boom, this was a Carl shock. Weathers. Here's yeah. uh, cut 12 here. This is a scene from Rocky when he was training uh, Sylvester Stallone's character. You want to live in the hospital for five weeks this time? You thought I was tough? This jump will kill you. All right. 
Come on, come on, get your head on your shoulders, man. Think about the fight, think about the fight. Clover Lang's in here, he's trying to hurt you, Rock. He's trying to hurt you, okay, here he comes. Jab, he's hooking, he's hooking, he's hooking. This is me, I... this is me every morning getting the kids out the door <laughs> for school. <laughs> I love the evolution of that character. You know, he started yeah. out as as the opponent of Rocky in Rocky One, Rocky Two. They had mutual respect for each other. They loved you. And then in Rocky Three, against Mister T, T. Clubber Lang, yep. uh, he brought in Apollo Creed after Mickey died. Uh, the, the Rocky movies are great. Um, here he is with Arnold Schwarzenegger. The first time the two of them meet in Predator. What's the matter? The CIA got you pushing too many pencils, huh? Had enough? Make it easy on yourself, Dutch. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. You never did know when to quit, huh? Damn good to see you, Dutch. What is this entire business? Oh, come on, forget about my time, man. I heard about that little job you pulled off in Berlin. Very nice, Dutch. Good old days. Yeah, <laughs> like the good old days. Then how come you passed on Libya, huh? Oh, that wasn't my style. I love, I love how they're talking about their special op stuff and how they get good old. And then when they go down to fight the Predator, somehow, inexplicably, they both end up uh, with uh, uniforms, camo, that are sleeveless. It's amazing. Oh, how nice. I know. Don't forget, too. You mentioned totally the Rocky rippling. movies. You, you yeah. mentioned the, the Rocky movies being so great. They really did tap into the mood of the nation. Don't forget, Apollo Creed was killed off by that evil Russian commie Soviet. boxer. What was his name? Right. Ivan Drago. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, and by the way, he did comedy too. Adam Sandler had a great tribute to him. Yeah. Here he is in Happy Gilmore. Um, it's a great scene. Alligator bit my hand off. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Tournament down in Florida. I hooked my ball in the rough down by the lake. And alligator just popped up. Cut me down in my prime. He got me. But I tore one of those eyes out, though. Look at it. <laughs> You're pretty sick, Chubbs. <laughs> and then he finished his career carrying Baby Yoda around that's in right. Mandalorian. He did. Yeah. That's, that's quite a quite a quite a guy. And everybody, no one had anything quite bad to range. say about him, which is very hard to do when you get through Hollywood to not have anyone have anything bad to say yeah. about you. Rest in peace, Carl Weathers. Thank you for entertaining us. It's yeah. seven fifty four.